Hello students, my name is Emily Poole and I'm here to talk to you all about AP European History Unit 1, Renaissance and Exploration. But wait, before I do that, what I want you to do is click the link in the description below and download a speed review guide that I have made for you. But I don't want you to do anything with it yet. Just download it and have it ready. Then just watch the video and listen to me teach you all of the information you need to know for Unit 1. And at the end of the video, I'm gonna have you do something special with that. All right, is it downloaded? Are we ready to go? Let's do this. I'm going to start off by just telling you unit one in five sentences. Number one, the rediscovery of classical Greek and Roman texts leads to a rebirth of learning in Europe called the Renaissance. Number two, a political, cultural, and intellectual shift occurs as humanist thinkers focus more on individual achievement and secularism rather than purely religious affairs. Number three, exploration to the Americas results in an abundance of food and wealth for European monarchs and merchants but great destruction for indigenous peoples in the Americas and Africa. Number four, while many European farmers rely on agriculture and subsistence farming, economic changes due to the connected hemispheres leads to innovation in financial systems and the rise of a money economy. Number five, monarchs like Henry VIII, Charles V, and Ferdinand and Isabella lay the foundation for modern political institutions. But how did it all get that way? Let's contextualize. When the Western Roman Empire fell, Europe fragmented into small feudal kingdoms. Because of invasions and because of the Vikings, it became unsafe to trade and travel, so people just lived their lives on these small-scale manors. Trade was restricted and Europe became increasingly isolated. And it was in this time of political fragmentation that Catholicism and the Catholic Church became the glue that held people together. Their canon law provided a source of stability in otherwise fragmented Europe. And this time in Europe is sometimes called the Dark Ages. It's also sometimes called the Age of Faith. But what is it that leads to this renaissance, this rebirth in Europe? It's the Crusades. Starting in 1095, these religious wars connect Europe to civilizations that were far more technologically advanced, right? While Europe was in its dark ages, other civilizations in Africa and Asia were in their golden ages. As a result of this, Europe is able to gain new technology and new information and new innovations. And also they're connected back to those trade routes that really just all link up right in that Eastern Mediterranean region. Now this floods Europe with new technology like rag paper and movable type and trading cities start to emerge in Northern Italy. And it's no coincidence that it is in Northern Italy, like Venice and Genoa and Florence in these trading cities where the Renaissance starts. Because it's these cities that are bringing in a lot of new goods, but also an abundance of wealth. But not only is Europe gaining access to new innovation and technology, they're also reacquiring texts from antiquity. Greek and Roman texts that had been preserved in Islamic madrasas and within the Byzantine Empire are now being brought back to Europe, and scholars like Petrarch start to read the classics. And this revival of classical learning leads to the rise of humanists, people who focus on the individual and individual achievement. These humanists start to challenge traditionally held sources of power in a ton of ways. And what's their first main target? The Catholic Church. These humanists begin to shift their focus from religion and theology to secularism, the here and now, and human potential. As these humanists are immersed in the history from Greece and Rome, they start to admire these secular political institutions. Niccolo Machiavelli writes his treatise on political behavior called The Prince, in which he advocates, quote, for although the act condemns the doer, the end may justify him, and that as a leader, quote, it is better to be feared than loved if one cannot be both. Also studying the classics, Castiglione writes the Book of the Courtier in which he addresses how men and women should act in polite, civilized society. Y'all, it's like the first book on manners. And this focus on humanism also extends to the artistic world. Remember those really wealthy Italian city-states that I was talking about earlier? The people who control them start to spend that money bedazzling their city and sponsoring art. The Medici family, who controls Florence quite notably, sponsors artists like Botticelli, Brunelleschi, Fra Angelico, and Michelangelo. Like, they want to make themselves look good, and they also want to make their city look good, and they also want to make everyone know how much money they have. Have. Let's for a moment talk about the historical thinking scale of continuity and change over time. I love a good CCOT. The College Board loves a good CCOT. So let's talk about it regarding art. Art changes during the Renaissance from these golden heavenly scenes that utilize the hieratic scale to religious scenes and natural settings to Greek and Roman mythology to regular humans doing things like eating a bowl of beans. 
These artists who have gained new skills like perspective and a vanishing point start to make great leaps forward in artistic skill in Europe, and the Renaissance artists start to focus on the classical ideal of the human form. But over time, art from the Italian Renaissance mimics the spread of secular humanism that's happening in society, representing a change in artistic style and skill. But while the subject matter and the artistic ability change, religion is still important and is still a common theme throughout the Renaissance. And we see that most clearly in the Northern Renaissance. The Renaissance spreads from Italy to the Low Countries where it embodies more of a religious focus. Similar to the Italian Renaissance, Northern Renaissance artists still consider humans and human achievement appropriate artistic themes. And artists like Bruegel become obsessed with portraying regular people doing regular things. On the literature side of the Northern Renaissance, Christian humanism is the focus of Desiderius Erasmus. In contrast to Machiavelli's The Ends Justify the Means, Erasmus argues that a leader should lead by Christian example with virtue and courage. So these humanists across Europe are starting to write treatises on what it means to be a participant in civic culture, how to act in proper civilized society, and what it means to be a good leader. But how are other people able to read what these humanists are writing? Let me introduce you to one of my favorite people, Johann Gutenberg. Johann Gutenberg radically changed society with his invention, the printing press. Y'all, look into my eyes. Look into my eyes. I cannot overemphasize how crucial the printing press was to Europe's revival during the Renaissance. I want you to imagine right now if you only owned a handwritten copy of your AP history textbook. How long do you think that something like that would take to make? How long do you think that that sacred text would cost to buy if literally every word was handwritten? Literacy, learning, and education were mainly restricted to the wealthy and the elite during the Middle Ages in Europe. And it's the printing press that brings education to the masses. Books can now be mass printed, which means that books become way cheaper to buy, which means that they're more accessible to the average person. People start writing in their local language, the vernacular language, rather than Latin. And, you know, when people start to be able to read and write in the vernacular, that definitely contributes to the rise of specific national cultures cultures and identities. To summarize, the printing press is probably like the third most transformative thing to happen in world history, and it absolutely paves the way for what we're going to talk about in future units, like the Protestant Reformation, the Scientific Revolution, and the Enlightenment. So Europe is in its rebirth, it's in its glow up, it's thriving, and other states, not just Italy, want to get involved in this prosperous and wealthy trade. Spain, notably, wants to get involved in the Indian Ocean trade, but they don't want to go through that ever-impressive Ottoman an empire and all of their taxes. So what ends up happening? Ferdinand and Isabella sponsor Columbus's voyage to, in theory, go find a direct route to the Indian Ocean trade. Now, Columbus was from Genoa, but then moved to Lisbon in order to study navigation and learn more about fun new navigational tools like the astrolabe, the compass, and the quadrant. And then he convinces the king and queen of Spain that he can find a direct route to that Indian Ocean trade and all of its rich, rich, prosperous wealth. And where does he end up two months later? The Caribbean. This is the new world to Europe because it was new to them. They didn't know it existed. Word spreads quite quickly about this abundantly fertile land that is just ripe for the taking, and other European powers like the Netherlands, Portugal, England, and France start sending their own expeditions over. This age of exploration was motivated by three things, gold, glory, and God. Gold in the form of literal gold and silver, glory in the form of honor to you and also to your monarch that sent you, and God in the form of Jesuit Catholic missionaries. But with so many Western European powers sending over ships to the Americas, conflict is bound to happen. In order to prevent conflict on the Iberian Peninsula, the Pope steps in and sets the Treaty of Tordesillas, a line of demarcation that allows Portugal to colonize everything east of the line so they get very involved in Africa and the Indian Ocean and also Brazil, and Spain gets everything west of the line, so North and South America. And England, France, and the Dutch also fight for land in North America. Um, but Emily, what about the indigenous peoples living in the Americas? Ugh. Great question. Historians estimate that between 90 and 95 percent of indigenous Americans were wiped out due to diseases like smallpox, but also due to wide-scale slaughter and destruction. 
And with this new abundance of fertile farming land, slavery also drastically increases. And the transatlantic slaving system sends enslaved peoples from Africa to work on sugar, cotton, and coffee plantations in the Americas. This was disastrous for enslaved peoples who were shipped along the Middle Passage and led to catastrophic demographic consequences in Africa. So the hemispheres are connected. Afro-Eurasia is now connected with the Americas and the exchange of flora, fauna, goods, and resources and people becomes known as the Columbian Exchange. As a result of this new trading system that is set up, wealth in Europe shifts from the Mediterranean region to the Atlantic region and new trading cities pop up like Amsterdam and London. As the city's wealth increases, so does their population, and over time, they start to become these growing urban financial centers. Having American colonies leads to the rise of mercantilism in Europe. Mercantilism sets up restrictive trade practices between the colonizing country and its colonies at the expense of the colonies for the profit of the imperial power. And what do these increasingly wealthy European countries start to do with all of this new wealth and resources? They establish banks and joint stock companies, of course. Yo, know, the Dutch East India Company is the wealthiest company to ever have existed in all of history. Sorry, Jeff Bezos. And it is because they control all of the spice trade in Southeast Asia. And the economic system in Europe begins to change as a result of this commercial revolution as the foundations for capitalism are laid. I mean, look no further than the Dutch Republic in the 1600s. The Dutch were so obsessed with tulips, which by the way is my favorite flower, so like I kind of get it, that this so-called tulip mania and its hasty downfall was the first recorded speculative bubble and crash in history. Um, but Emily, what about the not wealthy people in Europe? Because they matter too. They do. Thank you, young astute learner. Yes, the average European still makes their livelihood off of agriculture, utilizing that two or three field system, and most were subsistence farmers. Lower class farmers are impacted by the commercial revolution as this commercialization of agriculture occurs. Wealthy landowners start to buy up common pastures in what is called the enclosure movements, forcing some farmers to abandon their fields and move to the city. But with these new world crops like the nutrient-dense potato, population in Europe does reach its pre-Black Plague levels in the 16th century. And this population growth is still true even despite economic hardships and environmental challenges like the Little Ice Age, which both delayed childbearing and marriage. But smaller family size did ultimately improve the economic standing of the average European as they were not as strained with resources. But this is mainly happening in Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, serfdom is codified into law, and it's during this time that we start to see an economic difference arise between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Western Europe becomes increasingly more money-based as new economic elites emerge, while in the East, old-school social hierarchies based on land ownership still persist. And with all this influx of wealth coming in from the Americas, monarchs start to truly live large and start to lay the foundation for a centralized monarchy modern state. English monarchs like Henry VIII and Elizabeth I start to utilize religious reform in order to maintain control over the people within their state. Henry does this, of course, with the formation of the Anglican Church, and Elizabeth fights a lot of wars in order to keep Protestantism as the faith in England. Ferdinand and Isabella, but really just Isabella, let's be honest, begin to consolidate power over the Spanish military and also over religion in Spain as their Reconquista unites Spanish provinces under the banner of Catholicism, and their Inquisition results in the expulsion of many Jews and Muslims from Spain. While adherence to a specific religion is supported by some monarchs, Charles V passes the Peace of Augsburg, which allows states within the Holy Roman Empire to decide for themselves whether they want to practice Lutheranism or Catholicism. And while monarchy is still the standard form of government in much of Europe, wealthy merchants do start to play a bigger role in politics, notably secular politics, and I wonder what's going to happen with that. So to wrap it all up, culturally, Europe undergoes immense changes as a result of the requisition of Greek and Roman texts, which spurs on humanist and secular thought. Rather than solely focusing on theology and religion, humanists begin to explore new, diverse academic interests. Politically, new monarchs gain and consolidate their power with help from the wealth of their new world colonies. Competition to control this trade leads to conflict among European states. Economically, the hemispheres are connected, leading to a massive increase in resources and a massive increase in 
money to those who control trade. New economic elites emerge and Europe marches toward a capitalistic economic system. And socially, the population of Europe reaches its pre-plague levels. Most Europeans still rely on agriculture and orient their lives around the manor or village life. The commercial revolution and the enclosure movements in Western Europe lead to urbanization while in Eastern Europe, serfdom is codified. So that is it. That is all of unit one. And now what I want you to do is go back to that guide that I had you download right at the start of this video. And I want you to look over the terms that are listed, check off the ones that you do know, circle or highlight the ones that you don't know, and then spend some time in your own words, summarizing those major thematic developments. And if you wanted some extra skills practice at the end of all of that, all you need to do is look at those comparisons, that continuity and change over time, and that causation that I have listed for you, and maybe start thinking about how you could answer those in a thinking map or in a Venn diagram or some kind of bubble map. And if you found this video to be helpful, make sure that you get yourself the AP European History Ultimate Review Packet. It has exclusive resources made by yours truly in order to help you achieve maximum success in your AP Euro class over the course of the year. Okay, bye!